So the book of Revelation indicates that in the last days, a modern Babylon will arise, similar to ancient Babylon, as we mentioned, and equally devastating in its impact on the people of God. We discussed a lot about ancient Babylon and what happened then in Lesson 7. If you'd like to go back and review that, we will not cover all that. In today's lesson, we're going to really study the characteristics of that ancient Babylon and then examine carefully spiritual Babylon in the book of Revelation. And we'll see that the prophecy doesn't mean that there's going to be another literal city named Babylon at the end of time, but rather it is a modern spiritual Babylon. It will have all the characteristics of evil that brought about the fall of the first Babylon. This final spiritual Babylon will be one of the key players in the drama unfolding in Daniel 11 and Daniel 12 and in Revelation 13. And just like ancient Babylon, it too will fall. Let's look at, the, at ancient Babylon and see what aspects of this pagan city are to be found in our lives and in our religious practices today. The Bible clearly teaches that God still performs miracles that he still heals people, and that there is a genuine gift of tongues today. However, in Revelation 13, it predicts that modern spiritual Babylon will be particularly unidentifiable because of the overemphasis on signs and wonders and miracles and healings and tongues. That's going to just dramatically increase, and, and it the important thing we'll find out is how do we know if that's from God or if Satan is deceiving us? If it starts to increase dramatically, how will we know? We do know that God tells us these will be counterfeit, but the world will believe that God's power is behind it, and they will believe it when they see it. Sometimes, you know, I know every day we say, wow, something miraculous happened, and we know God's hand was in it because we can see that. But... At the end of time, when we get very close to Jesus' second coming, there will be many miracles. How will you decipher if that's God's power behind it or Satan's? Our faith today cannot be based on signs, wonders, tongues, and miracles. It has to be based on the word of our living God. The holy scriptures are our only safety in the time ahead of us. I know that we say many, many times, you have to read your Bible, you have to read your Bible, but it has never been so important as it is now when Satan is ramping up his deceptions and he is trying to deceive all of us. We need to know truth from fiction. And in this world we live in today, there's more fiction than truth. And we have to be able to separate that. And we use the word of God to know where the line is. It'll be important that, that we are aligned with the only truth that is found in the Word of God. And you have to read it and know it. If you know God's Word, you won't be fooled. If you have a relationship with God, you won't be fooled. Because God will reveal to you when something is a deception. Let's review ancient Babylon first of all, and we'll decipher what those characteristics of ancient Babylon were and how evil it was. Babylon was, the, was first mentioned in the Bible in connection with the destruction of the ancient Tower of Babel. You read this in Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9. But before we go into that, let's step back even further in history for a moment, just to give you some historical background. You'll remember that Cain and Abel were sons of Adam and Eve, so we're going back to Genesis. Cain killed his brother Abel, because Abel's, sa Abel's sacrifice was accepted and Cain's sacrifice wasn't. Cain had disobeyed God and God cast him out and away from his family. He was fearful of God and he began to create walled cities and to create false gods. 
and worship ceremonies. His descendants became known as the Canaanites. They began to worship the sun on the first day of the week in direct opposition to God's word of worshiping at the end of the week on the seventh day as the holy day of worship. They had knowledge of a savior and they knew that he would be born of a virgin. As well as the prophecies given to Adam and Eve, Cain systematically perverted the truth. So it began much further back than we think. Now let's move forward a few years in history. And you remember that the city of Babylon uh, was built by Nimrod. If you study your Bible, it's in there. Nimrod, if you remember, is Noah's, let's go back to Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jepheth, who went into the ark with their wives just before the flood occurred. Jewish tradition tells us that Noah's son Ham was married to the daughter of Cain, the one who killed Abel. So now we're seeing where that evil, we thought when the flood came, it wiped out all that evil, and we were starting fresh. But one of the sons was married to a Canaanite who already had worshipped other gods, and he already had this in in her. So quite likely, in spite of Noah serving the living God, his daughter-in-law was a Canaanite. Ham's son, Cush, had a son named Nimrod. And that was a hundred years after the flood that Nimrod built the city of Babylon. Or, and you can see Babel was where Nimrod started that process. Fearful of another flood, even a hundred years later, the people began to construct that Tower of Babel. Some people say Babel. Uh, I'm not sure which is correct, but I'll say it. I'll say Babel. You say Babel. It, it, we get the word babbling from the city of Babel because we can't understand what's being said. They wanted to reach the heavens and make a name for themselves. You know the rest of the story. The languages were confused which caused them to stop building and move away from one another since they couldn't understand each other. Keep in mind that Noah would have still been alive since he lived 300 years after the flood, seeing all this happen. Just a bit more history. Nimrod ended up marrying his mother, Samiramis, after Nimrod was killed. Samirimus gave birth to an illegitimate son, claiming that he had been supernaturally conceived and that it was the virgin birth of her baby son, Tamaz, and he was the savior of the world to be worshipped as a god. Does that sound familiar? A virgin birth? A son who would be worshipped as a god or a king of the world? That sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Well, Satan surely knows what's coming. And Satan knew that if he could deceive people and distract them by having this story play out, it would play out all through history. And he did. And he used Samiramis for that. Where Nimrod called himself the sun god, Samiramis called herself the moon goddess. She was worshipped throughout the world by each of the titles associated with Nimrod's worship. For instance, the Greeks worshipped Aphrodite. The Romans, Venus, the goddess of love. Artemis and Diana, Athena and Minerva. She was the wife of Jupiter in Roman mythology. The sister and wife of Zeus in Greek mythology. So in every culture, a goddess of heaven was worshiped thanks to Samiramis and her propaganda. With time, the father became invisible and was no longer worshiped, whereas the mother, with the God incarnate son in her arms, became the grand object of worship. Numerous Babylonian monuments show the goddess mother, Samiramis, with her son in her arms. The worship of mother and child spread throughout the known world, given different names, 
in the various languages of the world. Germans worship the Virgin Hertha with child in arms. Scandinavians called her Visa, pictured with her child. From Babylonian times in all cultures, there has been a worship of the goddess of heaven and her divine son. The Egyptian mother and child were worshipped as Isis and the infant Osiris seated on her mother's lap. In India, the mother and child were called Devaki and Krishna, and they are still worshipped to this day. You can see this picture of Egypt, India, and Greek paintings and the goddesses they worshipped. Roman pagan citizens worshipped the goddess and sun as Fortuna and Jupiter. The image of mother with child in her arms was so firmly entrenched in the pagan mind that when Constantine merged paganism with Christianity in the fourth century, these statues and paintings were merely renamed with suitable Christian names and the worship continued. The statues of the Queen of Heaven was renamed the Virgin Mary with her God incarnate Son, Jesus. In fact, in Tibet, China, and Japan, Jesuit missionaries were astonished to find the counterpart of the Madonna and Child as devoutly worshipped there as they were in Rome. Xing Mu, the Holy Mother in China, was portrayed with a child in her arms and was worshipped by the entire country. I'm sharing this little bit of history because so many Protestants have no idea how it came about that there is worship today of this statue mother and child associated with Christianity. It is a practice right out of Satan's playbook. Satan knew the prophecies that there would be a virgin birth and that the Son of God would come into the world. What a better way to neutralize the impact of that than to create a false worship around a human woman. You see, Satan is steps ahead of us because he knows the story better than we know the story. And he is able to create these diversions of what he can do, again, to keep the impact of what God has said from being accepted by all people. So I just want you to be aware that the reason we stopped to talk about this is I know there are many who pray in front of the Virgin Mary statue and they give homage to the Virgin Mary above and beyond praying to God. And this is a scary thing when you understand where this came from and God never intended this to be. God is our only, he's the only being worthy of worship. We don't worship other beings. We don't worship statues. We don't bow down to them. We don't lift up prayers to these statues or these people that we think are somewhere else. We just worship our Lord and Savior. And we just have to stop these practices that were merged into Christianity as pagan practices. It began in Babylon and it spread to the entire world. And it is still with us today as we all know. This is just one pagan practice that has come down through the centuries that our entire world embraces. So let's get back to ancient Babylon. What did God do to the people at Babel who didn't believe God or trust him? We read in Genesis 11, 9, from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So in the midst of their rebellious attempt to build this tower, God came down and he confused the languages and forced the people to scatter throughout the earth. Babel has come to mean confusion because God confused the languages 
at this point in history. Let's not forget the reason for the confusion. Man had rebelled against God and in defiance to him, erected this tower. Babylon, though, did continue to grow throughout the ancient times, reaching the height of its power in the time of Daniel. So what did ancient Babylon do to God, God's people? Well, we know in Daniel, if we start in Daniel, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, the king of Babylon besieged Jerusalem. As we've already studied, Babylon is the power that took Daniel and the Jewish people into captivity. So the second characteristic of ancient Babylon was that it persecuted and tried to destroy God's people. The first characteristic was their rebellion and defiance by worshiping false gods. And the second characteristic is their desire to destroy God's people. You may recall the defiant act of Babylon's leaders when drinking wine with the vessels from God's house, which we covered before in a previous lesson in Daniel 5, verses 2 and 3. They drank wine and they praised the gods of gold. Here we find Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, in a drunken stupor, calling for a servant to go and bring him the sacred vessels that he had captured from Solomon's temple when Daniel and his people were taken captive and brought back to Babylon. Now Belshazzar knew that these were sacred things from the temple, and he knew they had been consecrated to Jehovah. I'm sure he had grown up hearing all about the interaction between his grandfather and the God of heaven and what happened. But he didn't believe it. In his defiance, and just to prove how much he disliked having something in his kingdom that he'd most likely been warned not to touch, he brought them to his party and filled them with wine and toasted his gods. So now we find another characteristic of Babylon. Belshazzar took the sacred items and mixed it with the profane. It is a defiling act to mix elements of worship of God with worship of the world. So the third characteristic of Babylon is mixing truth with error and sacred worship with false worship. That night, Belshazzar lost his kingdom and his life. The Medo persian army, while this wild party was going on, came under the gates in the Euphrates River, which had been stopped, entered this great hall, and slaughtered everyone there partying. Now, who controlled this theology of ancient Babylon? Once again, we discuss this in Daniel 2, 2. The magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans, these men were the brain trust of ancient Babylon. They were the prophets. They were the interpreters of dreams and visions, and they practiced magic and studied the stars to find out the future. They often used the entrails of sacrificed animals or the flight of birds to find out the future. They sought advice from the spirit world and from the dead. The Chaldeans were scholars who actually laced their scholarship, their intelligence, with spiritualistic phenomenon. So the fourth characteristic of Babylon was that it was given over to the control of spiritualism. Here then are the four characteristics of ancient Babylon. They were in rebellion and defiance of God. They sought to persecute God's people. They mixed genuine worship of God with pagan worship and their power was controlled by spiritualism or Satan. Now let's take a look at modern spiritual Babylon. 
How does the book of Revelation describe modern spiritual Babylon? Well, let's read Revelation 17, verses 1 through 6. You might notice a subheading, which in my Bible, which is the NIV version, it's titled Babylon, the prostitute on the beast. So I think it will go into that a little bit more and explain what that means. It calls her the great harlot that sits upon many waters. This is kind of tough language when you're reading the Bible to say, what? You would stop and say, I don't really understand why they chose to say that. What does that mean? Why does the Bible call modern Babylon a harlot? Because the church is the bride of Christ. Modern Babylon has turned its back on its allegiance to the bridegroom or Jesus Christ. We see further in Revelation 17, 5, the name written on her forehead was a mystery. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Here is the modern reenactment of ancient Babylon. The Bible indicates in the last days that there will be a revival of Babylonian style power. The mother of harlots will have help in corrupting the earth's population. Let's find out who's going to help her. If the Christian church, as formed by Jesus Christ on earth, was the mother church, but now God says it's the mother of harlots, that means the mother of children. Who are these children? Well, it must be the churches that branched off from the mother church but continue to practice false doctrines. The Bible describes modern spiritual Babylon in more detail in Revelation 17, 3. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy. Blasphemy is a defiant and rebellious attitude just like those who built the Tower of Babel. Modern Babylon defies and rebels against the God of heaven by going against his clear word and doing as they please, no matter what the Bible says. Is that the world we're in? Doing as you please, no matter what the Bible says? You can see they're talking about our day and time. Babylon is called out in Revelation 18:2, with the first angel saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons and every, every impure spirit. There is a warning to escape Babylon in Revelation 18.4. So we know the world is going to represent the characteristics and God is pleading for his people to come out of Babylon. Don't participate in these characteristics that we just went through that will be going on in the world. Will modern spiritual Babylon persecute the saints of God like they did in the past? Well, let's see what Revelation 17.6 says. She was drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. We can expect modern Babylon to persecute God's people. We know for 1260 years in the Dark Ages, the years of the Inquisition, over 50 million people were martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. Now the persecution has begun again. It is happening all around us. More than 340 million Christians, that is one in eight of every Christian, faces a high level of persecution and discrimination because of their faith. And this is according to the 2021 World Watch List. This is recent. That's how much persecution is going on. We may not feel it. We may live in comfortable little Charlotte and not feel the persecution that Christians are facing. But let me tell you, in some countries, they're all being persecuted. And it's a matter of time before that jumps across the ocean. We know what Christ has warned us about, what's in the book of Revelation, and we need to be prepared it's growing, and the hostility towards Christians is not even subtle anymore in all the nations of the earth. And we are living it today. All you've got to do is look at the headlines, and you know you can't be honest. You can't share your faith openly. God has been taking out of everything, schools and legislative buildings and 
Everywhere that our country began its foundation, it's being ripped out. So yes, we are living in this today, but it hasn't gotten to the point that we are feeling the persecution possibly, but it will come. Revelation describes the acts of modern spiritual Babylon in Revelation 17, 2. It says, the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Obviously, this is speaking of spiritual adultery and fornication. Spiritual adultery is mixing truth with error or mixing truth with pagan customs and adding that to Christianity as though that is the truth. Fornication is false doctrines that are lovingly cherished. This is why it's important to know which doctrines are false so you don't cling to them. Drunk with the wine of false doctrine. Drunk in prophecy indicates that the false doctrine has been swallowed hook, line, and sinker and has become an integral part of that person. The kings of the earth indicate that the highest levels of mankind will buy into the false doctrines and command their obedience. When we speak of the wine of the fornication, we're speaking of truth mixed with error, such as immortality of the soul, eternally burning in hell, worshiping on a day a week other than the one that God commanded, false baptisms, purgatory, limbo, the Eucharist, where you're crucifying Christ each time you take communion. Not all communion, just people who believe that they're crucifying Christ when they break the bread. Replacing Christ with a priest for confession. Those are just a few of the areas where truth has been mixed with error. And paganism has been mixed with Christianity. There are some of the false, these are some of the false doctrines that make up the wine of the church's fornication. That makes people drunk. And we said drunk means they believe these false doctrines. I have to tell you this quickly. My Catholic friend and I had lunch a, a few days ago. And she was born and bred Catholic and is a strong believer in the Catholic faith. And we had a discussion, and she asked me, why do you believe that you immediately don't go to heaven when you die, when almost everybody else does? Why do you think you're right and you're different? I said, one thing I will tell you is that we read the Word of God, and we study it, and we know what's in it. And did you know what you believe is not in it? So why don't you read the Bible and come back and tell me if you can find where when you die, you immediately go to heaven. And she got very quiet. <laughs> and she's a Googler person, and she started Googling at the table. She wanted to Google what I was saying. And she tests me with everything I say. She pulls out her phone and Googles it. And as a matter of fact, about two weeks ago, she was with me. And we've been planting seeds with her for a long time, but she was with me, and she said, why are your commandments, your Ten Commandments, different than mine? <laughs> I said, okay. I love it when they ask these questions. You know, it shows there's a pure interest, and it shows that the Holy Spirit is working. But she didn't realize she was going to get a whole lesson when she asked these questions. But the good news was she got very quiet and listened, and then she started Googling. And she could not find anything. And I said, you know what the issue is? We have so many people who are so distracted by the world, they don't have time or take time to study God's word. So they're like sheep, and they just follow whatever the leader in front of the church is telling them. They think, well, they must know more than me, so I better follow what they're saying, because I believe they must know the truth. But if everybody up front is telling a different truth, then you need to question where is the truth and go back to the Bible. I said, these are like sheep being led astray without realizing it. I said, and it, bottom line is, people are too lazy to study the Bible. They would prefer somebody to tell them what's in the Bible. And they would prefer for somebody to explain things to them than to look it up themselves. So I did encourage her to go back and read the Bible because that's what we use as the foundation of everything we preach and teach and share. So I thought that was a great 
example of how the Holy Spirit will do the work if you plant the seeds. And so we all have to be out there doing that. But it was interesting that those questions came up right in, in tune with what's going on here because all this false paganistic doctrine is mixed in with Christianity and the whole world is falling for it. We find that modern spiritual Babylon is filled with what? In 18.2, we find it's the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Just as ancient Babylon was controlled by spiritualistic phenomenon, so too will modern spiritual Babylon be controlled. So we all see that all the characteristics of ancient Babylon actually find their counterpart today in modern spiritual Babylon. It is characterized in the same way and is in co controlled by the same power. Let's look at the characteristics of modern Babylon. You'll see these sound just like the ones from ancient Babylon. Rebellion and defiance of God. Seeks to persecute God's people. Mixes genuine worship of God with pagan worship. And Satan's spiritual, spiritualistic power controls it. I immediately think of this book that has swept the world time over, and there's been multiple versions, Heaven is for Real, in absolute contradiction to God's word that says the living know they shall die, but the dead know nothing. So anybody that says they died and they went straight up to heaven and they got to participate or see things going on in heaven and then they come back to tell us about it, you have to wonder what the source of that is. Because the dead die and the dead know nothing. We know that because it's in the Bible. So we have to be careful of man's fiction books that are filled with feel-good stories, but not truth. Let's look at the identity of modern Babylon. Modern Babylon refers to a power that will exist in the last days that will mimic ancient Babylon in every respect. And this last power will seek to destroy the people of God. It is the power described in Daniel 11 and 12. It will be given full expression in Revelation 16 through 18. Modern spiritual Babylon is a conglomeration of powers that have bound themselves together. Now remember the beast we studied last week that Ellie covered in great detail was a compilation of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Modern Babylon is split into three parts, as we read in Revelation 16, 19. The three parts are shown under the seventh plague in Revelation 16. The system of the papacy, the apostate pro Protestantism, and modern spiritualism. Now keep in mind as we study these Bible verses. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. The original mother would be the same as the original beast of prophecy 13 that has been clearly identified. In previous lessons, we went in great detail about this, so you might have to go back and look, but it was clearly identified as the system of the papacy. The original Christian church turned into what we know today as the Catholic church. Following Constantine's merging in 321 BC of paganism with Christianity. I'm not speaking of good Catholic folks. As I say, I have several friends, very close friends that are Catholic, and several in my family also that are extended members that are all born and bred Catholics. Most of them have never studied the prophecies and are simply worshiping as they have been taught since their infancy. But with Jesus coming soon, now would be the time to open your Bible and study for yourselves as never before. Don't be led astray. The beast of Revelation 13 fits the characteristics of ancient Babylon in verses 1, 4, 5, and 7. Upon the head, the name of blasphemy, found in verse 1. Verse 7, to make war with the saints, and they worshiped the beasts. In verse 4, the beast of Revelation 13 is a symbol of papal apostasy of the dark ages. 
Now, we studied this in Lesson 9, if you need to go back and review. It has all the characteristics of ancient Babylon. It blasphemed God in defiance and rebellion. It persecuted those who disagreed with it. It mixed together truth with error. And it received false worship. It is the great mother church that introduced the original apostasy in the Christian church. It's the first of the three parts of modern spiritual Babylon. Let's see how the Bible describes the other parts of modern Babylon. In Revelation 17, 5, the mother of harlots, or again, as some versions say, prostitutes, the second part of Babylon also is called a harlot. It is composed of Protestant churches who left Rome but continue to practice Rome's doctrines that mix truth with error. And any church that mixes truth with error constitute, constitutes modern Babylon on earth today. Revelation 13 describes the second part of Babylon in Revelation 13 verses 11 and 12. Another beast came up out of the earth, and he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. The second beast that we identify in our lesson last week was the United States of America, who follows in the footsteps of the first beast. According to Revelation 13, Protestant America joins hands with the first part of Babylon, which is Romanism. So the joining of Romanism or Roman Catholics with Protestants and trying to bring them together under united front. As these powers join together, they become this mighty spiritual Babylon. Well, is that happening? Here, we recently seen the joining hands of the Roman Catholic Church more closely with the Protestant Church and leaders under the new Green Sabbath. To save our planet, the Pope is joining forces with other religious leaders. It will continue until we all come under this modern spiritual Babylon rule. Now, we've talked about this before. I don't want to get too off track because I need to finish the session. But as you recall, and Ellie has covered this numerous times in great detail, and you can look it up on the Internet. But this Sabbath, the green Sabbath that the Pope is promoting to save our planet is for us to take a day of rest, for everybody to stop and take a day of rest so that we don't use up all the resources on this earth before we survive it. This day of rest, this Sabbath day of rest, this green Sabbath, he is calling Sunday. Now, does that sound like what God had called the Sabbath? The Sabbath is Saturday. It's not Sunday. Again, it's a diversion to get people to say, yes, it's a good idea. Green Sabbath is a good idea. We should do it. We're all in about saving the planet. I don't think there's a person in our church that wouldn't say it's a great idea. But when do we rest and give the planet rest? On Saturday, we do it on the actual Sabbath that God called us to remember, right? So you have to be careful. Do you, you can see Satan, how he deceives through making little changes and twisting things so that you might say, oh, that's a good idea. But when he's trying to get you to rest on Sunday and not on Sabbath, he is trying to move the day of worship. And it's very subtle, and people will fall for it because it sounds great, and it's something we should all do. But if you know your Bible, you know your day of rest is on Sabbath, which is Saturday. Now, if you want to take a day of rest on Sunday, go for it. We can save the planet on Sunday, too. So we don't have an issue with that, but be careful if worship is tied in to this green Sabbath. If resting in worship is tied in, he is also trying to alter people to say, guess what? We already worship on Sunday. Why don't we just make that whole day a day of rest? So those are the things you have to look out for, and that's the only reason that we stand up here. We stand up here just to make sure you're aware of what's going on because we don't want you to be trapped by Satan's very evil deceptions. If he could deceive Adam and Eve, who knew God and walked with God, and he could twist words enough to say, surely you won't die, and put a question mark in your brain, he's got you. You see, because you have to be firm in knowing. They should have said, God said not to do it. We will not do it. 
Instead, they thought, well, it looks good. Maybe, you know, maybe we won't die, you know. Don't let those questions take you down the wrong path. Stick firmly with what God tells us to do. The third characteristic of modern spiritual Babylon is seen in Revelation 18.2. Babylon has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit. Spiritualism is the third aspect of modern Babylon. It will be the spiritualistic phenomenon that will give its great influence and the power to work miracles in the last days. But the miracles will come from Satan and not God. And most of the world will be deceived. Remember Isaiah 8.20. If anyone does not speak according to the word, they have no light in them. The second beast attempts to rally the world around the first beast. We see that in Revelation 13, verses 12 through 14. He doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now, we don't know what this miracle will be. Some believe the devil will call down the fire, as Elijah did on Mount Carmel. I personally believe that it could be a fire that comes down and it sits on top of the heads of praying people, like what happened in Pentecost. But we don't know what it will be. We will definitely see what it turns out to be. Or maybe it will be both. We don't know. But it will take the entire world captive and make them believe that God's power is blessing them. It is a big deception to make people believe they're safe and they're being blessed and that they're following God when they're really not. See, that's a dangerous deception, to think you're following God and you're not. And that's going on all over the world in so many religions. We see in Revelation 13, 14, that Satan deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Note that these will be genuine miracles. Satan will make a final, magnificent effort to deceive the entire world. He knows he's at the end. We're getting close to the end of times. We've been talking about that. Every sign in Revelation is starting to follow in suit, and he knows his time is short, so of course he's going to step up his game. Spiritualism will captivate the world. Modern Babylon performs the same kind of activities as it did in ancient Babylon to try and gain acceptance. It uses magic, miracles, signs, and wonders. All this will be done to induce people to worship the beast and his image. It is on the point of these miracle signs, wonders, that Romanism and the apostate Protestantism unite with spiritualism to form the final great apostasy against God and his law. You see, all these powers have to come together to really ignite what Satan is trying to put in place. So, the great sign that this final Babylon brings down from heaven, we know in Revelation 13, 13, is he makes fire come down from heaven in the sight of men. It could be this fire that comes down from heaven that will imitate the fire that came over the saints or in, in during Pentecost, or it could be a fire that he brings down that makes people think of what happened to Mount Carmel. We will see when the time comes. In the book of Revelation, fire symbolizes... In Revelation 4, 5, seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Seven is the number of perfection. Of indicating the seven lamps of the fire represent the perfect Holy Spirit of God. In the New Testament, fire is associated with what? We know in Luke 3, 16 and in Matthew 3, 11. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I believe this verse will be used to prove that the fire represents God's Holy Spirit and the entire world will be deceived. In the New Testament, fire is a symbolic of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. However, in Revelation 13, it will be one of Satan's counterfeits. But we've been warned. The entire world will be deceived with the exception of the people of God. 
What do these spirits of devils do? What are they doing? In Revelation 16, 14, we read, they are the spirits of devil working miracles. There you go. Miracles don't only come from God. The devil will produce miracles. The emphasis on the spiritualism in the world today making the charismatic movement the fastest growing religion in the world today. They believe in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit to prove that you're saved. They believe that if they speak in tongues and manifest other gifts that Jesus is absolutely working in their lives. And they believe that this baptism of the Holy Spirit is the only indication of salvation. You see how dangerous that would be for people that follow that. Acts 5.32 says the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey him. So if you aren't obeying God, you cannot be filled with his Holy Spirit. Let's never deceive ourselves on this point. John 14.15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Also remember Isaiah 8.20 as we said. What was the genuine manifestation of the fire falling from heaven? Well, in Acts 2, 1 through 4, they appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. But there was always an interpreter that interpreted what they said. This isn't how it is today. If you hear people speaking in tongues, it sounds like babbling. It sounds like gut utterances. It does not sound like a message that we can understand. And there usually is no interpreter there to interpret it. But they feel like, oh, I'm really filled with the Holy Spirit because I can do this. If you have other questions about this, there are so many articles and brochures and, and teachings on tongues. It is not what is going on in the world today. And we have to be clear on that because we already know in the Bible that tongues was a gift from God, but it was a gift to be used to further his kingdom and his message. How do you further a message by babbling? You know, you have to be real careful that what people say is happening is what God is involved in. It's not always God involved in it. So we have to look at that. And we have to say, why, what does God say now about this modern spiritualistic Babylon that we are living in today? Revelation 18.2 says, Babylon the great is fallen. Babylon is no longer the true church. She is fallen. Yet God still has many people in Babylon who love and serve him. What message does God send to his people in modern Babylon? Revelation 18.2. Four. Come out of her, my people. That's pretty clear, and that comes from God. Come out of her, my people. God is about to pour out the seven last plagues on spiritual Babylon. This great union of churches that has mixed truth with error and is preaching the need for living in the Spirit is seeking to take the entire world population away from God's truth. God does not ask us to reform Babylon. He asks us to come out of her and stand distinctly apart from his holy people who love him and keep his commandments. We need strength to endure and wisdom to hold fast to this truth of the knowledge of God and his word. We need to prepare. We need to study. We need to pray for endurance at this time and for the wisdom not to be deceived by Satan. Most importantly, you need a relationship with God, your Father. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He is there for you if you just ask, repent, and accept him as your Savior. There is no time like the present, as we don't know when our last day will be, or the last day of the earth's existence and the coming of our Savior. God sends us to share this news with you for a time such as this. You are not hearing this message by accident. You are hearing it and you are here because God knew when he created you in the womb that you would be here today, that you would hear this, 
and that you would need to respond to it because you cannot turn this down over and over again and be saved. My being here to present the word was really a warning and you being here to hear it is a blessing. Take heed. Don't let Satan distract you with things of this world which will no longer be. Come to him now and store your treasures in heaven. Your future depends on it and your heavenly home awaits you.